thank you very much, Anna. And thank, thanks to all of you for inviting me to what is a terrific conference. Um, those of you who are here for the first time, I suggest you check out the program tomorrow. Um, really interesting uh, papers and conversations are going on uh, these, these days. I want to thank the committee in charge of the event also for inviting me. I want to thank Mark Leff, Antoinette Burton for their remarks. And I want to especially thank Anna Karajek for taking such good, not only for her introduction, which was a really kind and generous one, but for taking such good care of every detail of my visit. I, if I had somebody in my life to take care of details the way Anna does, I would be really happy. <laughs> As she told you, um, this, book is t this talk is taken from a book I've just finished on a law that was passed in France on March 15, 2004, banning the wearing of Islamic headscarves in French public schools. Although my interests are usually more historical, I'm a 19th century French historian, I was fascinated by the debates on this topic, which divided previously united communities and political groups and occasioned ferocious disagreements among people who were usually allies or friends. I was also interested in the fact that headscarves were becoming an issue in many European countries. Interestingly, the way to take a stand on the question of how to integrate large numbers of Muslims in the secular but culturally Christian countries of the West is to ban the wearing of headscarves or veils. Why headscarves, I wondered. The statistics could not account for it. In France, there are about 8 million Muslims. 14% of Muslim women wear some form of head covering. In, 19, in 1994, there were around 2,400 2, cases of girls wearing headscarves or hijab to school. In 1996, thanks to the work of a mediator, there were around 100. And before the law passed in 2004, there were only a few hundred. I'm sorry, in 1996, it was 1,000. And in 2004, there were only a few hundred. Since its passage, the numbers of headscarves have increased on the streets, though not in the schools. In the Netherlands, where it's been proposed for security reasons to outlaw the burqa, the full body covering that also hides the face, there are about a million Muslims, 6% of the population, and perhaps 50 to 100 women who regularly wear a burqa. The numbers are similar in Britain, where last November, former Foreign Secretary Jack Straw's proposal to ban the nikba a garment which also covers the face and is worn by a very small number of women, dramatically increased sales among Muslims. What could account for the enormous attention being paid to such a minority phenomenon? And in France, to the clothing of a handful of schoolgirls in some Muslim neighborhoods? My answer is that these actions are largely symbolic and that they are rightly perceived by the vast majority of Muslims as a clear message about the unacceptability of Islam, whatever its form, in the host countries. Indeed, since, since September 11th, the idea of a clash of civilizations between Islam and the West has gained widespread acceptance, and with it, the equation of all Muslims with political radicalism, terrorism, Iranian theocracy, and cultural deviance. This is one way of displacing pressing problems of economic and social discrimination against, in France, the former North African colonial subjects, and of not dealing with issues of poverty and ethnic diversity in formerly more homogeneous European societies. In my book, I argue that the headscarf law is a, was a symptom of political hysteria, which focused attention on an imagined danger as a way of avoiding these real issues of racism, poverty, and integration, issues that remain unresolved. The headscarf, <coughs> or the veil, the words were used interchangeably, although they're very different items, was the sign of this imagined danger. It was treated as the flag of an, of an Islamist insurgency, something to be banished, lest it rally the troops for an onslaught against the secular, individualist, egalitarian principles of the West. I don't think this is the right way to think about veils. They are rarely tied to political radicalism, either by the women who wear them or by the men with whom they associate, although there surely has been attempt, have been attempts to instrumentalize them for political reasons. But this does not account for most veils. Typically, they are signs of religious commitment, but not of a traditional sort. I'm persuaded by the French sociologist Olivier Roy that the turn to Islam by immigrant populations in the West is a form of modern religiosity, not unlike born-again Christian piety 
or charismatic Catholicism or new forms of Jewish orthodoxy. This religiosity is embraced by a younger generation, often in rebellion against the accommodationist ways of their parents. It becomes the basis for new communities of individuals who produce various but dogmatic interpretations of texts and who have in common the quest for personal salvation and a spiritual ethical lifestyle in which authority comes not from within the self but from an attributed external divine command. Islam, Hua writes, cannot escape the new age of religion or choose the form of its own modernity. The attempt to define Islam as a singular and uniform culture, antithetical to everything Western, has made it hard to see its complexities and the varieties of belief and practice undertaken by very different groups of Muslims who have settled in the West. It has also obscured the fact that Islam, unlike, say, Catholicism, is not a centralized religion, but a pluralistic one, which, like Judaism, is articulated through a continuing and varied practice of textual interpretation. I think the attempt to ban the, the headscarf or the veil helps produce a vision of a homogeneous, transnational religious religion at odds with everything we value and believe. It fixes them in a simple stereotype, and it does the same for us. The result is two virtual communities with all their variety and complexity removed, presented as antagonistic to one another because of their irreducible difference. In the French case, Islam versus the Republic. I look at the French case not only because France is a country whose history I've studied for nearly 40 years, but also because I think we need separate examinations of the different political and social histories of the European countries as they each confront a somewhat different Muslim problem. There's not one Muslim problem. What is common and what is not is a question worth asking. In my book, I go into the particular reasons for French anxiety about its Muslim population. These have to do with a history of colonialism, particularly in North Africa, from whence now come the immigrants who have to be dealt with, and with racism against Arab Muslims, Arabs, Muslims, North Africans, and all of that is interchangeable. People refer to Arabs meaning Muslims. They refer to Muslims meaning Arabs. They refer to North Africans meaning Muslims and Arabs, although not all North Africans are Muslims. Not all Muslims are North African, uh, are North African or Arab, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that immigrant population is a post-colonial one and perceived as problematic. The other factors are the rise of the right-wing National Front Party and its virulent anti-immigrant platform. The parties of the center and even the left have had to accommodate the threat raised by the far-right parties by moving to the right and taking up immigration. It's not an unfamiliar story. Taking up immigration as an issue that they too will confront. Another issue is the threats to national sovereignty posed by Europeanization and globalization, the decline of the once vaunted status of schools and school teachers in France, and the challenge posed by various social movements to the idea of a nation one and indivisible. I suggest that it's no accident that the first of what were called les affaires des foulards, the headscarf affair controversies, occurred in 1989, the year of the bicentennial of the French Revolution. This was the moment of the construction of a myth of French republicanism that the attack on Islamic headscarves helped to consolidate. My lecture today focuses on only one aspect of this consolidation. And I have to say, having finished the book, it's very hard not to tell you everything, but I'm going to try not to. Um, you can ask me questions that maybe will let me do that, but now I won't do that. So I'm focusing only on one aspect of this today, the way French supporters of the ban on headscarves posited their gender system against the Muslim gender system. The strangeness of the Muslim's way of doing sex became the conclusive proof of their inassimilability. The focus on gender lent emotional intensity and moral conviction to those who wanted to eliminate the veil. It also made it impossible for French lawmakers to accept the insistence of many of the girls that they sought recognition as French Muslims with equal accents on both terms. And there, in this first slide, the, the poster says, Française, Musulman, French women, Muslim women. And it's that kind of um, what would here be a hyphenated identity 
that is at issue. The point is to recognize Muslims as genuinely um, part of French society. I'm going to argue that the sharp opposition posited between Islam and the Republic, especially but not only around questions of gender, made it difficult if not impossible, made difficult if not impossible, recognition of the need to admit the existence of difference in the composition of the French nation. The French nation, unlike the United States, means by one end indivisible that there is no um, ethnic or religious difference recognized. The French don't keep statistics on ethnic and religious difference, so they don't even know formally how many different types are in the population. Assimilation is the standard by which one becomes French. And if you don't accept or live up to what is considered the French standard, you are not considered um, fully French. I want to stress that what I'm going to be talking about today are ideological representations of gender, not the lived facts. It's the proclamations of French legislators and public intellectuals on the one side and a body of Islamic juridical and the theological teaching on the other that provide the material for this talk. So here we have the law of the 15th of March, 2004. And Article 1 is the relevant article. In public elementary, middle, and high schools, the wearing of signs or clothing which conspicuously manifest students' religious affiliation is prohibited. Disciplinary procedures to implement this rule will be preceded by a discussion with the students. This being a French school, you can, the discussion with the student is difficult for the student to say the least. But the explanation is what's really interesting to me. The clothing and religious signs prohibited are conspicuous signs, such as a large cross, a veil, or a skull cap. The, the large cross and the skull cap in the interest of French universalism had to be included in what was really an attempt to ban Islamic headscarves. In fact, when the first version of this law was suggested in 1994, uh, the Minister of Education wrote to the chief rabbi of Paris and said, don't worry about yarmulkes, we're not going to outlaw those. But in fact, if the law was to be universally applied, it had to include large crosses, veils, or skull caps. Not regarded as signs indicating religious affiliation are discrete signs, which can, for example, be medallions, small crosses, stars of David, hands of Fatima, or small Qurans. I've underlined in this, oh, yeah, I guess it is. I've, I've drawn attention and underlined the words conspicuous and discreet because they resolved the difficulty, the commission that recommended the law, the commission was called the Stasi Commission after the chair of it, the, the difficulty the commission had in articulating what exactly they were after. As is usual in matters of this kind, there was a great deal of discussion about the exact wording that could be used. For a long time, the talk was of banning ostentatious signs. But that word was dropped because it seemed to ascribe motives to the wearer of the sign that might be difficult to prove. Then there was the word visible. The head of a national, committee, the national assembly committee recommended that all visible signs of religious affiliation be banned from public schools. His colleagues demurred, largely because they thought the prohibition of things visible was too broad and would conflict with the European court's rulings that protected religious expression as an individual right. Conspicuous seemed a good alternative because it attributed the meaning of the sign to the sign itself. There was something objective about it, and yet still objectionable. It was more than visible. Well, it was conspicuous. The legislators opted for discrete as a way of distinguishing acceptable from unacceptable signs, since visibility could still be an ambiguous notion. Things that are conspicuous, after all, are also visible. One of the many commentators pointed to the futility of these academic distinctions. If you're having trouble following it, you're not the only ones. It might be possible abstractly, they said, to separate ostentatious, conspicuous, and visible, but in practice, it would be very difficult to distinguish among them. Still, I think the effort is worth our attention, not so much because it exemplifies the obsessive concern with language that one thinks of as characteristically French, but because of the preoccupations revealed that were not part of the discussion. I was struck by the sexual connotation carried by the words the lawmakers chose. When ostentatious or conspicuous refers to an excessive display on or by a body, especially if it's a woman's body, 
It conveys a sense of erotic provocation. Discreet is the opposite of ostentatious or conspicuous. It doesn't call attention to itself. It downplays the attractiveness of the body in question. It is somehow neutral, asexual. So in the opposition between conspicuous and discreet, the language of the law intensified its philosophical disapproval for the headscarves violation of secularism with a veiled reference to unacceptable sexuality. There was something sexually not right about girls in headscarves. It was as if both too little and too much were being revealed. But in what way too much? After all, the point of the headscarf, according to the girls who wore them, was that they signified modesty and sexual unavailability. For Muslims, ostentatious is to be avoided, ostentation is to be avoided at all costs. The Moroccan Arabic word tabarouj, anthropologist Abdullah Hamoudi tells us, means ostentatious, and it is the invariable term for a bearing that is deemed immodest or conspicuous. There's another word, fitna, as anthropologist Sabah Mahmoud, that refers both to sexual temptation and to the disruption of political order. The goal of modest dress for women is to prevent such disruption. By what standard could girls wearing headscarves be considered disruptive, immodest, or conspicuous? They did stand out in a classroom filled with girls in Western dress, but not because their clothing was more revealing. If anything, it was more discreet. More of their bodies were covered. How then account for this seemingly strange reversal? Muslim modesty is taken to be sexually aberrant by French observers who condemn it not only as different, but as somehow excessive, ostentatious, conspicuous, even perverse. The reason given by politicians and many feminists was the same. The veil represented the subordination of women, their humiliation, and their inequality. It must not be sanctioned by those who believed in the Republican principles of liberty and equality. I don't think that this is a sufficient explanation for the kind of sexual connotation the veil had for its critics. It was not the absence of sexuality, the repression of sexuality, but its presence that was disturbing, a presence underlined by the girl's refusal to engage in what were taken to be the normal protocols of interaction with members of the opposite sex. I think the veil's disturbing sexual connotation for French observers stemmed from its significance in a system of gender reg relations they took to be entirely different from their own. For Muslims, the veil is a declaration of the need to curb the temptations of sex outside the limits of family and community, a response, as Hamoudi puts it, quote, to the risks associated with our vital impulses. Mahmoud elaborates the point. This is a quote, although women and men are both urged to discipline their sight, behavior, and thoughts so as to prevent the stirring of illicit sexual passions, it is women who bear the primary responsibility for maintaining the sanctity of relations between the sexes. This is because the juristic Islam, Islamic tradition assumes that women are the objects of sexual desire and men the desiring subjects, end of quote. The veil, then, is a recognition of the threat that illicit sex poses for society and politics. In contrast, the French system celebrates sex and sexuality as not only free of danger, but of social and political risk. At the same time, sex, propo sex poses a tremendous difficulty for the abstract individualism that is the basis for French republicanism. If we're all the same, why has sexual difference been such an obstacle to real equality in the French system? I will argue in this talk that the headscarf, and I'll, go, I'll explain this abstract individualism point later, but I'm going to argue that the headscarf pointed up this contradiction in the French gender system. Islam's insistence on recognizing the difficulties posed by sexuality revealed more than the Republicans wanted to see about the contradictions in their own system. The French who supported the headscarf ban talked in terms of a conflict between emancipatory modernity and oppressive tradition. Even though the French schoolgirls who chose to wear headscarves did so not as members of traditional societies or communities, they did accept a distinction they attributed to Islam. I would say they wanted to operate in a system different from the French one in which they found themselves. 
In the terminology offered by sociologist Farad Koskovar, the differences are between an open approach to gender and a covered approach. Both terms refer to the treatment of the sex body. In covered systems, gender relations are regulated by codes of modesty. Modesty and honor are defined in direct relation to the bodily and mental, mental covering over of the woman. And this, these, are, this is, these are Pakistani women. This is not what the French headscarf looked like at all, but this is the um, extreme version of that kind of modesty. If traditionally the order of the family and the purity of the entire social body rested on the separation of the sexes, for young Muslim girls in France, it was their own bodily integrity, their own honor that was at stake. They talked about making an individual choice. In contrast, open systems are those which don't see the exposure of the body, its visibility, as detrimental. In these systems, a certain type, says Koskovar, a certain type of voyeurism and exhibitionism is positively valued. The language of the body is that of its accessibility to the other sex. The first of these slides, some of you will recognize. Oh, got it upside down. The first of these slides is the very famous Liberty Leading the People, um, the Delacroix painting that is emblematic of, of France. And the second is a kind of modern day version of uh, that same figure, of the, the figure of, of Liberty. The crucial point in all of this are the exposed breasts. There have been I don't know how many books and articles written about the exposed breasts of the liberty figures, but they are emblematic of not only France and of the Republic, but of the uncovered, open society that Koskovar talks about. As Western feminists have pointed out, uncovered bodies are no more a guarantee of equality than covered ones. In both systems, women have been deemed inferior to men and their legal rights have been restricted. Though it is certainly true that many societies with open systems have by now granted some measure of formal equality to women. In France, despite the bitter opposition of the same politicians who passed the headscarf ban in the name of women's rights, there is even a law on the books enacted in 2000 that calls for equal numbers of women and men on the ballots in almost all elections. But the parité law, the parity law as it's called, has not stopped the devaluing of women that reduces them to their sex and that led the politician Ségolène Royal's Socialist Party colleagues to try to check her presidential ambitions by reminding her that the race for the presidency is, quote, not a beauty contest. The misogynist campaign continues despite her recent nomination as the socialist candidate for president. Until their confrontation with Islam, many French feminists saw the sexual exhibitionism of their society as demeaning to women because it reduced them to a sexed body. But in the heat of the headscarf controversy, these concerns were set aside and equality became synonymous with sexual emancipation, which in turn was equated with the visibility of the female body. Let's look at this theme of visibility for a minute. In the headscarf controversy, opponents of the veil were consumed with the idea that it denied what they referred to as mixité, the mixing of the sexes in schools, hospitals, and elsewhere. The veil, according to the Stasi Commission and to innumerable witnesses who appeared before it, I should say that almost none of those witnesses were girls in headscarves, was an expression of Islam's strict segregation of the sexes. In fact, at least in the case of schools, the opposite was the case. Wearing a headscarf allowed girls who otherwise might have been unable to, to attend coeducational schools. But the real concern of some of the experts was, lex, was less mixité than it was the same visual status for the bodies of women and men. Hence, when psychoanalyst Elizabeth Rudnesco was asked if she thought beards should be prohibited in schools, since they could also be a form of fundamentalist identification, she replied that there could be no legislation about beards. Not only was such legislation impractical, she said, but beards, even if worn for religious reasons, did not constitute the same alienation for men that veils did for women. Beards were visible, while veiled women's bodies were not. Quote, I'm absolutely convinced that the real problem posed by the veil is that it covers over, il recouvre, a sexual dimension. It denies the equality between men and women upon which our society rests. It was precisely the covering over of women's sexuality that so troubled her. 
The veil was a denial, she said, of women as objects of male desire. Rudnesco was bothered not only by the veil's association with women's inequality, a contradiction of, spe of a specific Republican principle, she also thought that the veil interfered with what she took to be a natural psychological process. The visual appreciation of women's bodies by men brought women's femininity into being. And she thinks of herself as a called the veil a form of psychological, sexual, and social mutilation. It denied a young girl any possibility of becoming a human being. That's a quote. Mutilation was a big preoccupation. Some even equated wearing the headscarf with genital mutilation. Philosopher Andre Glucksmann described the veil as, quote, stained with blood, a reference to terrorists and Nazis, but also with inevitable connotations of cutting. The logic of Glucksmann's observation seemed to go like this. Terrorism constitutes the breaking of all the rules of political deportment. Veiling violates the rules of gendered interaction. The rules of gendered interaction are the basis of social and political order. Therefore, veiling is terrorism. According to this logic, it was difficult to maintain the view, also insisted upon by the lawmakers, that Muslim girls and women were victims of their fathers and brothers. Wearing the headscarf instead became an act of aggression. Jacques Chirac said as much in a speech in Tunisia in December 2003, quote, wearing the veil, whether it is intended or not, is a kind of aggression. In this comment, Chirac was conflating terrorism and the veil with an oblique reference to the hidden danger of women's repressed sexuality. Out there to see, women's sexuality was manageable. Unseen, it might wreak havoc, political as well as social. But Chirac was also saying something else. There was a double meaning for the aggression he referred to, that of the veiled woman, but also the response of the Western man looking at her. The aggression of the woman consisted in denying French men the pleasure, understood as a natural right, a male prerogative, to see behind the veil. This was taken to be an assault on male sexuality, a kind of castration. Depriving men of an object of desire undermined their, own, their sense of their own masculinity. Sexual identity in the Western or open system works both ways. Men confirm their sexuality, not only be, being able to look at, to openly desire women, but also by receiving a look from women in return. The exchange of desirous glances, the availability of faces for reading, is a crucial aspect of gender dynamics in open systems. It's important to remember that headscarves don't actually cover the faces of their wearers. They cover their hair and ears and necks, but their faces are plainly visible. Despite this fact, commentators conflated women in the Gulf states, whoops, that's not supposed to, women in the Gulf states, oh, actually, that, oh, I'm gonna go back to that one for a minute, if you don't mind, because I meant to show you that before as part of the um, icons of France. This is a, um, um, a picture from Figaro magazine in 1885, which asks, will we still be French in 30 years. And this is the bust of Marianne, and you know her because her breasts are uncovered, <laughs> in a Muslim headscarf. Um, they can't, this, is, this will always be France, but there's the headscarf. There's the, uh, the, the French uh, tricolore. Anyway, I meant to show you that one um, before. But okay, the confusion is the commentators treat, uh, conflate women in the Gulf states with those in France and insist on referring to veils as if they did cover faces. For example, when the French media figure Bernard-Henri Lévy was interviewed on national public radio in the United States about France and what was going on and among other things, the headscarf ban, his clinching point about the headscarf ban concerned the face. After lifting a number of objections to the veil and explaining the need for a law banning it, he ended by talking about how sad it was to cover the beautiful faces of young girls. That, in the end, was Islam's worst offense. The reference to the covered face that was not actually covered is at first perplexing. It becomes clear, though, when we realize that the uncovered face stands for the visibility of the entire body, and more importantly, it's a sexual availability. In this reasoning, a covered body becomes a hidden face. So it's understandable that Levy confuses the headscarf and the veil 
not because both are variations on a Muslim style of dress, but because both signify modesty and the sexual unavailability of the woman. That unavailability is profoundly disturbing to the way gender identity is lived by French women and men. While Levy seemed bemused and saddened by being deprived of the sight of female beauty, another common response is aggression. And that's, this gets back to my point about uh, Chirac. Here is the way psychiatrist Franz Fanon, writing in the 1950s, described male colonizers' attitudes to veiled women in Algeria. Quote, there is also in the European the crystallization of an aggressiveness, the strain of a kind of violence before the Algerian woman. Unveiling this woman is revealing her beauty. It is bearing her secret, breaking her resistance, making her available for adventure. In a confused way, the European experiences his relation with the Algerian woman at a highly complex level. There is in it the will to bring this woman within his reach, to make her a possible object of possession. This woman who sees without being seen frustrates the colonizers. There is no reciprocity. She does not yield herself. She does not give herself. She does not offer herself. The will to bring women within reach in the 1950s, when uh, Fanon was writing, had to do with the sexualized fantasies of colonial domination, white men conquering indigenous women as a metaphor for taking the land. In the new century, it has to do with a perceived attack, an aggression against what its French defenders insist is the right way, perhaps the only way, to conduct relations between the sexes. It's no longer the conquest of a new territory that's at stake, but the aggressive defense of the homeland, of the Republican principles of equality and liberty, a distinctively French form of sexuality that was even posited as an essential trait of national character. It was, in historian Mona Ozouf's words, la singularité française, the French singularity. The question of visibility came into sharp relief during the, in 2003, during what was called the Affaire du String. In October 2003, teachers and principals at some schools began sending home girls who were thought to be inadequately dressed because they were wearing le string, a thong exposed by low-cut pants and cropped shirts. <laughs> this kind of outfit exceeded the bounds of acceptable self-expression, the teachers argued, turning classroom attention to matters erotic instead of intellectual. A few commentators linked the string and the veil as opposite sides of the same coin. In one case, the body was overexposed. In the other, it was too hidden. Girls wore the string to make themselves sexually attractive to boys. They wore the veil to refuse that possibility. For some feminists, the same subordination of women was at stake in both cases. For others, there was a vast difference between the overt acknowledgment of desire and its suppression. When a government official proposed a return to uniforms as a way of getting rid of all of these difference, differences, his suggestion was opposed on the one hand by those who damned it as archaic, and on the other by those who championed the right of young girls to follow the fashion of the day. Government intervention from either point of view was unacceptable. Needless to say, while the string was considered a fashion statement, the veil was taken to be far more dangerous, requiring a law to protect the republic from its influences. Some of the girls wearing headscarves question the superiority of open to covered ways of dressing. Can their bras, ties, this is a quote, pants, miniskirts, underwear, and bathing suits all be so easily arrayed on one side or another of the divide between freedom and captivity? End of quote. Aren't there, in, uh, uh, not end of quote, aren't there instead two different systems of subjection at play? And this is a cartoon from that string affair it says, I wouldn't want to be in her place. <laughs> Each of them commenting on the other. In addition to the test of visibility, French critics of the headscarf also raised the issue of sexual freedom. On the eve of the passage of the headscarf ban, the, fr the feminist political scientist Janine Mousseau Laveau wrote an eloquent appeal against the law. It was not that she approved of headscarves, quote, when I pass a woman with a veil in the street, her article began, I feel a pang of emotion. Not, she explained, because she was hostile to the woman's religion, but because the veil designated the woman as a source of sin and as a potential whore. Those are quotes. As such, she was, quote, prohibited from sex with anyone but her husband or future husband. 
Mousseau Laveau felt deeply for this woman, deprived as she was of the sexual liberation that ought to be hers by right. But such liberation, the sociologist went on, could only come from being exposed to modern ideas at school. Indeed, public opinion polls demonstrated that modern liberal attitudes were held by those with high levels of education. The most bigoted members of French society were those with no degrees. Moussou Laveau then cited a study she had done in 2000 and 2001 of sexual practices in French society. Of the Muslim women she interviewed, quote, the only ones who transgressed Islamic norms and who had sexual relations before marriage were students and managers with advanced degrees, end of quote. Then again, these young women refused the dictate of virginity until marriage, and it was no accident that all of them had a higher education. If the test of liberation were sexual freedom, she concluded, then girls with headscarves must be allowed to stay in school. Quote, I think that school at whatever level can have this function and will aid those who are permitted to remain there to direct themselves to a freer life. Moussou Laveau differed with other feminists on the question of the wisdom of the law, but she shared their belief in the innate desire of women for emancipation in Western terms. It was clear to her that women would not choose the veil unless they were forced to. And that's what the um, legislators say over and over again. When they're not talking about the aggression of the veil, they're saying that they're saving these girls from the uh, forced choice that their parents or brothers or imams have imposed on them. This outlook stunned two Muslim women who were co-authors of a book called One Veiled, the Other Not. Duanya Buzar, who did not wear a veil, nonetheless marveled at the misunderstanding of Islam contained in the standard of liberation offered by French feminists like Mousseau Laveau. Quote, the leitmotif of their messages revolve around the idea that when Muslim women are free to sleep with as many men as they want to, then they will be integrated. Liberty is measured by the number of sexual acts they engage in, end of quote. Saida Kada, who did wear a headscarf, was the co-author of this book, reminded Bouzat of the first images to appear in France after the liberation of Kabul, quote, women putting on makeup, what symbolism from the burqa to lipstick? The French were reassured not about the well-being of humanity, but about the capacity of women to live up to Western models, end of quote. Bouzat's point about integration is telling. She rightly perceives that sexual liberation is at the heart of objections to the veil and to Islam more generally. It is not simply a question of individual autonomy hampered by communal loyalty, not just religious prescription interfering with the secular construction of the self. The self the legislators and their feminist supporters imagined was not only sexed, but sexual. Not only sexual, but sexually active in familiar ways. Jean Daniel, the editor of Le Nouvel Observateur, writing in 1986 about whether Islam could ever be transformed by its contact with French civilization, noted, quote, the problem of women, of the woman, the problem of sexuality, counts enormously in this story. Sexuality was the measure of difference of the gulf that separated Muslims from France. The clash of civilizations was said to be evident in the clash of gender systems. When Elizabeth Rudinesco testified before the Stasi Commission, she assured its members that a law banning headscarves was justified. In order to stress its urgency, she talked about it not as a routine piece of legislation, but as a major prohibition, equivalent to the incest taboo. The reference to the incest taboo is revealing. It suggests a deep uneasiness evoked by Islam's different ways of regulating sex and sexuality. It expresses as well the idea that Islam was not regulating sexuality as it should, that something excessive, even perverse, was going on. Incest, after all, is taken to be a deformation of what is universally moral, healthy, and natural. At the beginning of this talk, I said that many objections to the headscarf conveyed the feeling that not too little, but too much was being revealed. Now is the time to return to that point. French supporters of the ban on headscarves insisted that their notion of gender equality was not only French, but like the incest taboo, universally desirable. This was precisely the objection of some of the Muslim women I have cited. They refused the claim that the French system was necessarily more egalitarian, and they resented the caricature of their own beliefs. At issue was not just a conflict between open and covered cultures, 
but a specifically French way of reconciling abstract individualism and sexual difference. The French way involves, involves denial of the problem of reconciling those two concepts. In contrast, sexual difference is recognized as a potential political problem by Muslims. The separation of the sexes is a way of addressing it. Ironically, Islam puts sex out there as a problem for all to see by conspicuously covering the body, while France calls for a conspicuous display of bodies in order to deny the problem that sex poses for political theory. I characterize the difference between Islam and French republicanism by referring to a psychology of recognition and a psychology of denial. By banning the headscarf, French legislators insisted that they were removing the sign of women's inequality from the classroom, and in so doing, declaring that the equality of women and men was a first principle of the republic. Anyone who would pledge allegiance to the republic must endorse that principle. The visibility of the contours of the bodies of women and men, their easy accessibility to one another, the free play of seduction, were hallmarks of liberty and equality, the expression on the personal level of the meanings of a politically free society. Sex was not only not dangerous to political intercourse, it was a positive influence on it. And yet, women have long presented a challenge to French Republican theorists one that has become more difficult since they were granted the vote in 1945. Citizenship in France is based on abstract individualism. The individual is the essential human, whatever its religion, ethnicity, social position, or occupation. When they are abs abstracted from these traits, individuals are considered to be the same, that is, equal. Equality in the French system rests on the sameness achieved by abstraction. The one obstacle to sameness for many years was sexual difference. Women were the sex, and so could not be abstracted from their sex. Sexual difference was taken to be a natural distinction and therefore not susceptible to abstraction. Men could be abstracted from their sex because there were many things, not just the sex. How then consider women citizens? The history of French feminism demonstrates how difficult it was to grapple with this dilemma. Women must strive for abstraction in order to become equal, the same as men, but the difference of their sex, they were visibly not men, disqualified them in advance. Can women be the same and different? Well, yes and no. Yes, because by definition, citizens are abstract individuals, indistinguishable from one another. So once women are citizens, they are individuals. No, because by definition, sexual difference means that not all individuals are the same, Nature has decreed a lack of sameness and inequality that society and politics cannot correct. There is then a deep incompatibility between the reasoning of political theory, abstract individualism, and the unreasonable dilemma posed by sexual difference. Sexual difference does not seem susceptible to Republican logic. When women got the vote in 1945, it was as a particular group, not as individuals. In the recent debates about the parité law, the heterosexual couple was offered as a substitute for the singular individual. Men and women could complement each other in their difference, it was suggested, and this complementarity was a kind of equality. But just as the division of labor between husbands and wives in marriages has hardly produced regimes of perfect equality, so that division imported into politics keeps creating difficulties for women who want to run for office. The brutal treatment of Ségolène Royal is not the worst example of its kind. Both notions, citizens who were women, not individuals, and the complementarity of sexual difference, were put forward to correct, but not to alter the bottom line of French republicanism. Equality is still based on sameness. The idea that sameness is a prerequisite for equality, of course, is what leads to the insistence on assimil assimilation as a passport to Frenchness. There is then a persistent contradiction in French political theory between political equality and sexual difference. Politicians and Republican theorists have dealt with this contradiction by covering it over, by insisting that equality is possible while elevating the differences between the sexes to a distinctive cultural character trait, osus singularité française. As if to prove that women cannot be abstracted from their sex, 
There's great emphasis on the visibility and openness of seductive play between women and men, and especially on the public display and sexual desirability for men of women's bodies. The demonstrable proof of women's difference has to be out there for all to see, at once a confirmation of the need for different treatment of them and a denial of the problem that sex poses for Republican political theory. We might say then that paradoxically, the objectification of women's sexuality serves to veil a constitutive contradiction of French republicanism. This is what I mean by the psychology of denial. Islam's way of dealing with sexual difference avoids the contradiction of French republicanism by acknowledging directly that sex and sexuality pose problems for society, for politics, that must be addressed and managed. The systems of address and management vary. Political radicals, extremists like the Taliban or the Iranian Ayatollahs do not represent all of Islam. And they may not seem acceptable to Western observers, but we do not have to accept them to understand what the dynamic is and why it might be so upsetting to French Republicans. Modest dress, represented by the headscarf or veil for women and loose clothing for men, is a way of recognizing the potentially volatile and disruptive effects of sexual relations between women and men, driven by impulses that Hamoudi says, quote, are a source of continuity, but also of merciless dangers and conflicts, end of quote. Mahmoud adds that, quote, it is noteworthy that Islam, unlike a number of other orthodox religious traditions, does not place a high premium on the practice of sexual abstinence and regards the pursuit of sexual pleasure within the bounds of marital relationships a necessary virtue both for women and men, end of quote. Modest dress declares that sexual relations are off limits in public places. Some Muslim feminists say this actually liberates them. But whether that is the case or not, whether indeed all individual women who wear headscarves understand its symbolism this way, the veil signals the acceptance of sexuality and even its celebration, but only under proper circumstances, privately within the family. This is a psychology not of denial, but of recognition. I do, do not mean to say that the system is not patriarchal. It is, of course. But the French system is patriarchal, too, although in many different ways. My point is that sex and sexuality are differently represented, differently managed in the two systems. Paradoxically, for Islam, it is the veil that makes explicit, available for all to see, the rules of gen public gendered interaction, which are in no way contradictory and which declare sexual exchanges out of bounds in public space. It is this explicit acknowledgment of the problem of sexuality that for French observers makes the veil ostentatious or conspicuous in the sexual sense of those words. Not only is too much being said about the difficulties of sex, but those difficulties are being revealed. In France, women may be formally equal, but the difference of sex somehow belies that equality. The pious pronouncements of French politicians about the equality of men and women are at odds with their deep uneasiness about actually sharing power with the opposite sex. These are difficulties that theorists and apologists for French republicanism want to deny. The power of the psychology of denial is what led so many French feminists to abandon their critique of the status quo in France and rush to support a law that offered secularism as the ground for gender equality. It would take a whole other lecture to analyze the reasons for the abandonment by feminists of the themes of job and wage discrimination, glass ceilings, and domestic violence, what some have referred to as the exhaustion of the militant feminism of the 1970s and 80s. Suffice it to say here that in a kind of racist benevolence, reminiscent of some of their predecessors, feminists turned to the salvation of their less fortunate immigrant sisters. Their insistence on bringing but emancipation to these benighted women reminds us of Laura Bush's defense of the war in Afghanistan as an effort to liberate the women there. Entirely forgotten in the glorification of the freedom of French sexual relations was the critique of these, by these same feminists who for years have decried the limits of their own patriarchal system with its objectification of women and overemphasis on their sexual attractiveness. It's the power of their unconscious identification with the Republican project their own acceptance of the psychology of denial that led many of them to unequivocally condemn the headscarf as a violation of women's rights 
and to talk as if the status of women in France were no longer a problem at all. The preservation, and this is the, my final point, the preservation of a mythical notion of France in its many aspects was a driving force in the Affaire des Foulards. The deep psychic investments were less about fears of terrorism. There were surely better ways to deal with terrorism than banning the headscarf, some of which were actually suggested and ignored by the various commissions, than about defending French national identity, an identity in which the French way of addressing the relations between the sexes was a critical, inviolable component. Indeed, as sociologist Eric Fassin has noted, the new emphasis, only about 10 years old, on the foundational nature of sexual equality is a way of insisting on the immutability of the republic in its current incarnation. Sexual equality has only recently become a primordial value in France, and that specifically in relation to Islam. Muslims who don't share this value are not only deemed unacceptably different, but inferior, less evolved, if capable at all, of evolution. The ultimate proof of the inassimilability of Islam thus comes down to or adds up to sexual incompatibility, an incompatibility so profound that it compromises the future of the nation. The stark representation of the difference between France and its Muslims, I argue, misreads the demands of the girls in headscarves to be recognized as already French, and those are tricolore uh, headscarves, and so impedes the work of integration that is so sorely needed these days. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer questions, listen to objections. Yeah. Um, you kind of touch upon it, and I'm sure your um, book will touch upon it, but how does defining um, Muslim women then define Muslim men and masculinity in French society? I'm just kind of curious, um, being that it seems as if they were to um, get rid of this, the, the veil, um, they could assimilate easier into French society. And I'm wondering if what did Muslim men have to do to assimilate into <laughs> <laughs> French society? And, um, you know, in, in terms of how is defining Muslim women defining Muslim masculinity? That's a, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, early in the talk I said that the veil was treated as, a, as the flag of an enemy um, group. And basically I think they have to give up being... Um, Muslims or give up the identifying um, uh, aspects of Islam that create problems, um, prayers in the workplace, okay. I mean, th that, that sort of thing. Um, the interesting thing in all of this was that the Muslim men, actually the boys, and it's a kind of extension of the, um, of a kind of general hysteria about Muslims, but the boys were presented as the real reason the girls were wearing the veils. Mm -hmm. That is, there were, there were all sorts of stories, and, and of course there are always a few stories, but stories that became typical of um, gang rapes of girls without veils, mm -hmm. of um, boys harassing them, of, um, and so the, the, the young Arab slash Muslim boy was seen as the force behind uh, the, the headscarves and also that group that would be stopped if the schools, their power would be stopped if the schools forbid the, the wearing of headscarves. But basically I think it became symbolic of um, Islamic difference being stated or insisted upon and some um, secularizing gestures being required or accommodation to secularism being required if um, Muslims, men or women, were to be um, assimilated. Yes. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was really good. Um, thanks for speaking up for women, mainly Muslim women. <laughs> um, I really think uh, the attack on Muslim women in Europe, which is spreading now, 
or in, not only in France, you know, Britain, uh, right. Netherlands, and uh, actually even the Vatican, I heard, recently had um, acknowledged the ban and um, as, a, as a actually a, so a social and cultural problem in Europe. Um, as, a, as a Muslim woman, I'm really happy that you can speak up for us, and I uh, uh, very often think that Western think that Muslim women are oppressed, that's why they wear the veil, right. and this is the aspect which you actually brought up in your talk, and, um, and I actually agree with you that somehow women was used uh, in this case to actually um, oppress the men's sexuality as well, you know, in, in a Muslim, for attacking Muslim men, basically, as you mentioned, either the woman was perceived as being op oppressed, forced to wear the veil, or, you know, um, Muslim women were, were too, you know, too s more s sexual than Western men, right. so they keep harassing women and all these, uh, you know, excuses. I agree with you, but I, uh, I assure you that, uh, which you know, that uh, as a Muslim woman today, I feel more liberated by wearing the veil than not wearing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm happy that some people will respect that. Now, coming to my question is, you mentioned the little statistic about the women who who been forced to get out of schools and the handful of schools right. who have been closed. Uh, are those like private schools or? No, 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 no. What, the law applied to public schools. Um, North African Arab Muslim populations are, live in the suburbs, the banlieue, the suburbs outside of Paris for the most part. These are, these are sort of segregated ghetto communities. Obviously not everybody who is, North African, Arab, Muslim lives there, but these are the centers of it. And it's the schools in those areas, they were called uh, ZEPs, uh, zones that needed special attention, um, because special money, because the kids were poor, uh, they came from um, poor families, and so on and so on. Um, and it was in those schools that uh, these Affaires des Foulards first started. The first one was in 1989. And the principal of the school, it was a public school, it was a, what we would think of as a middle school, it was a college, um, sent home these three girls who came with their headscarves. And that began a saga that lasted um, almost, well, uh, almost 20 years. I mean, it was 1989, then there was another one in 1994, and then in 2003, four, and the law was passed in 2004. But we're talking about public schools. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it was hard to keep count, but there were maybe 2,400 in 1989, 1,000 in 1994. And because they appointed a mediator, a woman who herself, Hanif Sherifi, her name was, who was North African, um, and who would mediate the thing. The girls could wear uh, coverings to school and they'd put their headscarf down when they walked into the class. Or they could wear turtlenecks, you know. They had actually what they called the light hajib, which was a bandana that went across their, their head. Um, I'm glad they were creative enough to uh, be able well, they were, they, And that was why, though, in 2003, three, four, there were so, so many fewer. Yeah. Um, the, once the law was passed, girls who insisted on wearing headscarves to school were expelled. And um, either they came to some form of accommodation, many of them had to because they came from poor families. And in France, welfare payments to families depend on the attendance in public school of your children. So they, they, they go to school, take their headscarves off. And there are more, as I said, more headscarves on the street now than before the law, but not in the classrooms. Or some of them were sent back to um, Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco, some of them into early marriages. Some of them now go to private school. Um, interestingly, many of them Catholic schools where they are allowed to wear their <laughs> headscarves. What are the great ironies <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of this whole thing? Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I lived in France and uh, I am Algerian myself mm -hmm. and uh, thanks for sharing and I hope this phenomenon will never happen here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions? Yes.
In the context of your research, I was wondering if you felt like this controversy was maybe another form of imperial assertion of power over the immigrants in France, if maybe it was a sort of colonial hangover, um, maybe a denial or maybe even justification of a colonial past. Well, yes and no. Um, and let's go back to that one that I missed in the, in the first. Um, uh, yes, because these are um, colonial subjects, former colonial subjects. And in fact, I have a, a chapter in the book on racism and the way in which the veil figures in a long history of, of racism from the conquest of Algeria in 1830 all the way through the Algerian war. I mean, it's particularly Algeria, as you probably know as, as well as, as I, that is, that is uh, the place that poses the problems because Algeria was called a department of, made a department of France. Morocco and Tunisia were protectorates. Algeria was integral to France. And so, in fact, letting go of Algeria was a much more difficult and, and but so yes, in, in some ways, it's a continuation of, of the racism that informed colonialism. That is that there are these inferior peoples who need to be civilized by the French. La mission civilatrice, it was called the civilizing mission. And um, here they are now with us, um, and we need to continue. But the difference is that the earlier racial depictions of um, North African, Arab, Muslim, I put slashes between them because they all get conflated, even though, as I said, they're all different. The earlier depictions are all about French conquest of these people. If they're sexual, it's the women that they're conquering. If it's uh, if it's about land, they're taking the land. But it's all about we, our power to take them. With something like this, it's turned around. Now the portrayal is that they will conquer us. They are going to take over. They are going to outbreed us. I mean, French has always had a, a complex about its low birth rate. I was just reading a, a, a thesis the other day that said that, in fact, this whole populationist thing and the low birth rate is actually exaggerated that, in fact, the birth rates in France are as low or as high at different points as they are in other places. But the French are particularly uh, hysterical about low birth rates. Um, and a famille nombreuse, a large family, is considered a family of more than two. Um, Muslims and, by the way, also Orthodox Jews who also come from, have come back or are from North Africa have much larger families. And all of the language now is about being taken over, which is what this is, right? Will we still be French in 30 years? And there she is, Marianne. Um, and th this is actually, somebody pointed out to me, this is actually not a hijab, as all of you who either know about them or wear them know, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an Orientalist. It's a 19th century Orientalist representation of the exotic uh, uh, veiled woman. So it's the colonies come back to take us over. And that is, that is how it's, it's, it's now presented. It's not simply a question of our, our I use our as if I were French, but our um, continuing to dominate these peoples, but their threat to our way of life. Um, it, it's, it's conquest reversed or inverted. And, um, and that allows, and since Islam then gets identified with an international movement, um, a clash of civilizations, but the identification is, is an international global Islam, um, the danger or, or the representation of French immigrants can avoid the whole issue of the colonial past. These people become dangerous or discriminated against or whatever, not as former colonials, although of course everybody knows they are, but the, the ideological representation is as of a threat that has other reasons than the internal domestic ones of discrimination, poverty, the legacy of colonialism come home. So it's an interesting kind of twist on the kind of thing that you're asking about. Antoinette, yeah. I know that you're interested in um, mapping the kind of particularity of the French national case, but it's, it's hard to listen to your story and think about 2003 and what other things were happening in 2003 and continue to happen now and to think about the ways in which France 
has tried to negotiate or renegotiate its relationship with the US, the whole French fry thing. Um, how would you, if you were to sort of historicize in contemporary terms the, the, this very particularistic national debate on a global stage, how would you situate it in the context of the, the uh, war against terrorism, the alliances, the ways in which the French have broken with that, have sought to distinguish themselves from the Americans? I mean, what is it that's being articulated in a, an acclaim now about French universalism at this particular historical juncture, a juncture in which the legacy of post-colonialism is surely present, as you're suggesting. But I wonder if you could sort of nuance that laterally for us, since you've given us this sort of um, French North African dyad, could we, right. could we get a more lateral view of that? Well, it's tricky because I think what you're describing is right, that the French have taken positions internationally that are at all, we come out better on, on the issue of um, multiculturalism, which the French would uh, object to, they do object to whenever you, you, I mean, if I were to do a talk like this there, they would say, well, of course, she's an American multiculturalist. Of course, she doesn't understand that universalism is the true, our universalism, French universalism, the only, paradoxically, the only universalism um, <laughs> is, is the best way of, of doing things. So I think when it comes to the negotiation of the French values of secularism, individualism, universalism, and the notion of a nation one and indivisible, um, that story is one in which the worst aspects of the colonial heritage of racism come to the fore. And the context of September 11th and the war on terrorism intensify the, that, that domestic story. Um, I mean, I think if you go, the, the, the story in England is different. In Germany, where you're dealing with Turks who were never um, um, colonial possessions, it's yet again different. In the Netherlands, it's, so I, I think, I mean, my point, I guess, is, is that on the one hand, you have the previously um, more or less homogeneous societies of Western Europe, um, Christian secular societies, um, Christian in parenthesis, but certainly I have a chapter on the history of secularism in France and the compromises with um, Catholicism are extraordinary. You know, holidays, the prayers, the blah, blah, blah. Not in school, but all sorts of other ways of, of handling it. So um, the, the, the domestic policy turns out to be different. The international context in which a class of, clash of civilizations is somehow become the language of a certain kind of representation, um, objectifies Muslims in ways that um, make the differences very hard to, to see. Um, so I, I actually think um, what you're referring to are uh, welcome strategic moves on the part of the French from the point of view of some of us who are critical of, of Ameri the American empire but have little to do with the treatment at home of um, these populations. Um, and how they're going to deal with the issue of integration. I mean, the, the crisis for universalism, and I, I, I argue this in my book on parité, the first crisis is posed by women in the, in the 80s who say, OK, um, universalism isn't working. Let's reconceptualize the abstract individual as two a man and a woman, not a couple. That, that's what happens to it. They become a, a nice normative heterosexual couple. But simply say that, OK, there are two bodies that the individual could possibly have. Leaves out transgender, leaves out all the complications that have, that have happened since parité began. But OK, we have these two bodies. They're, they're, there's anatomical dualism what they say, as opposed to sexual difference. Sexual difference is about culture. The attributions to the body, what we would say are, is gender. But So sexual difference for them is the attributions to the body by cultures of meaning. Anatomical duality is simply duality. And let's just say that that individual is, comes in one of two sexes, means nothing for their innate capacities. It's not essentialist in that way. It permits, though, the abstraction of women from 
their sex. So that was the first kind of thing. Then comes the um, gay movement, the gay liberation movement, which demands domestic partnership, gets it, but in the course of getting domestic partnership raises the question of families and adoption, and um, the legislators and most of the population go crazy about the idea that the family, the family, the nuclear heterosexual family is not the foundation of French society. And so gay couples cannot adopt in France. They have no access to a reproductive technology um, and so on and, and so forth. But so those things begin to question the notion that there is a kind of way that universalism and the republic represent us all. And then the pressure from the immigrant groups comes in, in the same period, in the 80s. This is actually how I got started doing this stuff, as I was looking at all of these pressures on universalism in the 80s, not just women, but gay movements and then movements of immigrants saying, OK, integration has to happen, and it doesn't have to happen by our becoming the same as you. Um, that is, uh, France has had a long history of, France was the largest society of immigration in the Western world in the, in the 19th and early 20th century, but assimilation sort of cloaked that, and it was mostly uh, European immigration. Um, but okay, let's acknowledge the difference, let's recognize the difference, um, not treat it as the inferior vestige of uh, colonial subjects, just take us for, for what we are, which is, uh, um, um, Francaise musulmane, Francais musulmane, and, um, and deal with that. And they create high commissions on integration, and they create, and all they can do is come up with laws reaffirming universalism. So that the, the best example of this is at the end of the Algerian War in 1962, Algerians were given French nationality, whether they were Arab, Muslim, or French, French, because they were, take, they were French, the, the ones who came. To, um, to France, so they were, and their children, any children born in France were considered French. So in 1993, they re, in, there's a conservative government in power, they redo the law, and they require that children born of um, Algerian parents in France can no longer automatically assume citizenship, but they have to make a pledge of uh, loyalty to the republic, that is that French national identity is their first and only identity, that the communal demands of Muslims are private, secondary, don't, don't matter. And they have to furnish proof of what's called enracinement, um, rootedness, that is assimilation, in order to get. Um, uh, the same thing happened in 2005. Well, that law was modified by the socialists, but still the, the, the proof of um, belonging is, requ is a requirement for becoming a citizen when the law before gave them citizenship automatically. In 2005, when there were riots in the, in the uh, banlieue and um, all of these mostly young unemployed boys are saying, you know, this is not about, the first th uh, accusation that went away very quickly was, okay, this is, is, this is Islam, you know, here, they're finally the, what we've been afraid of is going to happen. No, no, that got calmed down. It's about discrimination and poverty and all the rest of it. And Sarkozy, one of the candidates for president now, said, these are not only rabble, but these are foreign influences who have come into France to organize these these riots, which was not true of most of the people who had been arrested um, during the, the uprising. But they passed these very severe laws that now um, allow them to deport with almost no, um, well, in France, you don't, you, you're guilty until proven innocent anyway. And so um, you can deport very quickly foreigners who are thought to be um, uh, bad influences or who have violated the law in some way or another. And the number of, of, of arrested or people who were done what was a tiny, tiny group. But the notion that um, it was foreign elements organizing um, these people, and, and these people who are demanding recognition as full-fledged members of France, wanting, you know, saying things like, well, my name, I go apply for a job, and my name gives me away. Or I give them my address, which is the banlieue, and, um, uh, that's the end of my possibilities for, for, for getting a job. So that was, it was about discrimination. 
and the protests against discrimination get attributed to foreign influences as a way, again, of displacing the problem or placing the problem somewhere else. Yes, Tamara. Thank you, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, my question has to do with the fact that in the 1980s, when we see the emergence of um, the sort of uh, defense of l'exception culturelle, cultural exceptionalism in France, and we start to see that being put into policy in the GATT, in the World Trade Organization um, agreements, and then this translates, of course, as I'm sure you know, um, to then le droit à la différence, the, the right to difference, right, which is being used by the French um, in the face of globalization to protect French national identity. Right. And my question is, um, was there any discussion when it came to the question of the veil of this theory of le droit à la différence, the no, right to difference, when it came to, you know, the way that it obviously comes into um, conflict with theories of universalism? And no, because universalism. it was over by then. I mean, the, 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 the movement for the right to difference was early in Mitterrand's first um, presidency. It was 81, 82. And it was about um, encouraging kind of regional um, uh, differences. You know, we could have a little Languedoc down here and a little mm -hmm. Breton up there. And it was about recognizing the pluralism or the plurality of French Frenchness. But because um, immigrant groups started to demand to be included in this um, uh, droit à la différence, it was dropped very quickly. It was by the, by the, the time the next legislative, legislative elections, they decided that it was in, it, the indifference to difference was the policy. Hmm. And that was um, um, put into effect and stayed in effect um, ever, ever after. Hmm. So um, the, the interesting thing actually is the, the more interesting thing in a way is the, the stuff that Todd, Todd Shepard has turned up about in the early days uh, before the Algerian War and while there were movements of liberation that had begun, there was an attempt to do what could only be called affirmative action in, in, Fran in the metropole, in France, by having 10% of jobs in the civil service reserved for North Africans, mm -hmm. especially Algerians. And um, that actually was a policy that was in effect for quite a while. If you say now that that would be, that's a policy that, that should be used to deal with the questions of discrimination and, and um, the difficulties in the labor market, they tell you that, again, affirmative action um, didn't even work in the United States, and they quote you the most right-wing um, um, critics of affirmative action as proof mm -hmm. um, that, it, that it couldn't work in, in France. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There was a tiny handful of, um, of feminists and others. Um, there were people like Françoise Gaspard and, and Claude Sévan Schribert, uh, um, Delphi, Christine Delphi. Uh, there were um, Etienne Balibar, uh, Farad, whom I quoted, Kosko uh, There were people like that, but they were this tiny handful, of this beleaguered minority who were um, um, very much um, misrepresented and, and vilified by other Republicans. Um, Gaspar and a group of others early in this whole thing uh, wrote a piece for Liberation, that they sent to Liberation, which was called, um, oh, I have to get it right, because um, um, something no to laws of exclusion in public schools. That was the headline. And the headline that Liberation, which was in favor of the law, replaced it with was um, yes to headscarves in public schools. And in fact, if you read the article, what they say is very much like, um, but not with the kind of, of sexual liberation dimension to it, but their argument was basically uh, a deep belief in the French secular educational system would um, save these girls from um, 
a patriarchal religion that you know how that that nobody would really want to support. And so they were very much Republican and secularist in their position. But the fact that they thought that the ban on headscarves was a really bad idea uh, was um, anathema to um, the, the people whom they worked with. There are also, I mean, there are, any, there are a number of books now by journalists. This, a guy named Thomas Del Tome. There was a group that was, again, I'm not, I'm not going to remember the name, but there was a group that had a, a website that was actually terrific that had all kinds of information. Another journalist named Trevian, uh, Pierre Trevanian. Um, but their voices were um, hard to hear and certainly in a tiny minority uh, compared to um, the overwhelming sense that um, this was um, a, a necessary thing that had to pass. And it should be added, the something like close to 50% of Muslims questioned about the, the ban also supported the law um, because they saw it as a way of hastening um, integration and, and assimilation. Come to the mic. Sorry. Was there a religious opposition in France as well? With the language, mm -hmm. it includes presumably Jew, uh, Jews yes. and Christian. And when there, if there was opposition, does that, what the opposition they had, was it just to remove the things that affected their own particular religious practices, or did they make commonality with? No, they opposed the law. The law. Okay. They opposed the law. And in fact, Cardinal Lustiger, not exactly somebody you want on your side in other kinds of battles, at one point said, you know, these kids in school, especially ever since 1968, these kids in school have Rasta hairdos. They have, you know, we tolerate everything in school. Don't confuse adolescent rebellion, which is what he said the headscarves were actually about, mm. with a, a, an Islamic threat. Um, just let it be, you know, manage it, deal with it. Um, it'll go away. The, the leaders of all of the religious groups in France were um, very much opposed to the law because they felt that any limit on an expression of personal religious conviction, which is what the European Union law says, that it's the expression of personal religious conviction that must be permitted even as secular laws are, are in effect. And the question is what the limit is of, of uh, personal religious conviction. But the leaders of the Jewish, the Christian, the, the Catholic, and the Protestant groups all opposed um, the law. Yeah. Thanks. My question, first of all, thank you, is about um, resistance, and I mean by school children, mm -hmm. um, at and um, the policing of, and I mean primarily by teachers, but also by administrators, right. of um, what constitutes public space. So at the borders, at the edges, and let me give you three s examples that come to mind. Um, how far into the, one, into the school building or <laughs> into the classroom can right. one wear one scarf, A. B. Um, you have a school outing, right? You're in, you're at the zoo. Can you wear your scarf? And C, which I'll follow up very, very briefly with, a, with an anecdote, um, photographs. Um, you know, this is f a photograph that even in a public school, presumably, my parents or I am paying for. You know, here I am with my diploma, can I wear my headscarf? And what brought this to mind was, and this was in America, a graduate student in another school, I swear, um, <laughs> in the sciences, but in a school nonetheless, in the sciences who um, had decided to start wearing a headscarf after her first year of graduate school. And so her photograph in the hallways was of herself without the scarf. And there are actually two different locations where she had her photograph. Mm -hmm. She was not allowed to retake the photograph with a headscarf. And so then cut out an Im you know, a scarf image and placed it on the, this is what she <laughs> was reduced to doing. So anyway, that's my question. Thank you. Well, I mean, the, the, the second two things are actually um, probably less relevant in French public schools than in American public schools. I don't think French kids go on outings very much. They stay in school. There's none of this sort of, of soft, uh, you know, look at the animals and come home and write stories about them. It's a much more <laughs> rigorous uh, education. Um, photographs, I'm, I'm just not sure of what the status of, uh, again, of photographs. But how far in, what, what a lot of the kids, the, the headscarf girls now do is they wear a, a long gray um, 
thing over their clothing. So they have a, a and then underneath it is a headscarf. So they take, they get to the door of the school and they take off the gray, the veil, the gray uh, outer covering. And then in the courtyard of the school, it, they, they still wear it. It's entering the classroom. It's the classroom space that is considered, that has to be the neutral uh, space. And there they drop their headscarves um, and let them just, uh, depending on the severity of the teacher in the classroom, they, but they take their headscarves uh, off. Yes. Actually, this is kind of related to the last question. I was really interested in the, um, like the idea of the conspicuous religious symbol, the, the veil being that, and you know, you did a great job of you know showing everything that's behind that. But I was wondering, um, suppose, like, how how would the law deal with something like if? Um, the, a head, the headscarf became a fashion statement, or, or a political statement. I mean, what, what? Um, well, this is know. what some of the critics actually said. It is a fashion statement, right. if it's a political. And, and in fact, the the um, the Stasi Commission um, was going to have a codicil in there that would forbid political expression in the schools as well. Um, T-shirts with Che on them, or you know, um, I mean that's that's sort of one. But but any political and that was turned down as uh, that was thought to be impossible because it would interfere with the kind of free expression of certain kinds of views um, in in the classroom. Yes, a lot of people said, well, this is just a fashion statement, and and you know, let's that's what Cardinal Westerker was saying. Basically, this is kids just you know, acting out, um, they're acting out one way, another group of kids is gonna act out another way, let them just do it. What school is for is, is something else. Um, but it was the insistence on the politicians and public intellectuals, the insistence that it could only mean a political slash religious statement. It was an Islamist um, a flag that these girls were either deliberately wearing or being made to wear. Um, that was, the, in fact, there, I had an, uh, an article I wrote about this before. There was this wonderful confusion of meanings. I mean, the thing about veils is that they give uh, vent to a, a whole series of confusions about fantasies of what's underneath, what's covered. I mean, there's one person who says, you know, a veil, what's under the veil? We don't know. A veil could hide a beard. This is one of the great kind of, um, but um, the notion was, the dis in the discussion was, we have to reduce it to one meaning. And that was why the whole conspicuous, ostentatious, discreet issue came up. Okay, if we say it's ostentatious, we say that they're purposely doing something. And then we were interfering, but they all, they all said, we have to make this it's clear that the veil means only one thing. It means the inequality of women in an Islamic, Islamist system that is at once political and religious. And there was no other way to do it. Let's do one more question and then we can go on to the reception. Yes. Well, in Algeria, of course, the French helped intervene in the election in, um, or in the cancellation of the election um, in 1991 that gave rise to the civil war that went on for a very long time. The French are on the side, even though they're authoritarian um, um, military leaders of secularism um, and against uh, the, the notion that it would be Islamic. Um, so I think there's division in Algeria, depending on who you talk to, about what this law is protecting France from, and by extension, um, perhaps Algeria as well. The, the more interesting thing, from my point of view, or the, point, the, the questions I had um, in this were, the place the veil plays in the struggle against colonialism in, in the Algerian war, um, and for the FLN, which at once is, led by socialists who are very 
uh, modern and secular in, in their notions of how women should be and associate the veil with tradition. And yet, on the other hand, associate um, the wearing of, of veils with the attempt to recapture an authentic um, Algerian Arab Muslim being pre-colonial, and 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 of course, if you've any of you have seen the bat the movie the the Ponte Corvo movie, the Battle of Algiers, the the veil is used, but men wear it, women wear it, women take it off. I mean, it becomes this um, instrument of resistance, which takes many many different forms. Then after Algeria becomes independent, um, it's the first. Uh, government, which is more socialist than um, Muslim in its leanings, the guy that the president makes all sorts of speeches, Ben Bella, about how um, modern women are beautiful and we don't need to wear these things anymore. And, and then he's unsettled by a, a coup, which is more Islamist than socialist, and the veil then becomes again um, a symbol of a kind of authentic um, uh, pre-colonial. Uh, um, characteristic or uh, expression of um, the essence of, of Algeria. So it's a really complicated uh, thing to follow. The interesting, one other interesting thing is um, it was less, I mean, within Algeria, the, this, the sides are in a way were predictable, the, the secularists supporting the law, the Islamists uh, opposing it. But I don't know if you remember when, um, those French journalists were kidnapped in um, Iraq. It was right when this controversy was going on, 2003-2004. And the girls in and, and the justification they gave, it became for a brief moment an international Islamist uh, cause. And the reason they said they kidnapped these, these journalists was because um, of the French headscarf law. And if the French would end the ban, they would let these guys go. And that was where, just in response to, to your question, Antoinette, the, the French, the different way the French have of dealing with um, the world of the Middle East and their different position in the Middle East played to great advantage, although they, they said no, they, no deals had been made. In fact, deals had been made. But the girls themselves offered, said, don't do this for us, um, at least the handful of girls who were at that point involved in the um, in the headscarf affair. The 2003 girls who kicked it off were two sisters named Levy, Jewish father, um, Berber Catholic mother who had converted to Islam, the worst nightmare of, I guess, of the, <laughs> of the, of the French, and of their communist grandmother who wrote letters to Limon saying, you know, I hate these scarves. It's only because their parents are divorced that they're wearing a headscarf. <laughs> you know, but keep them in school because school will straighten them out, basically. But um, the, the girls themselves said, um, don't you interfere. We don't want, let those journalists go. Take us instead uh, as, as hostages. But don't interfere. This is a French issue. This is not an international issue. Stay out of our Francaise Musulman um, campaign because we don't, we are French. We don't want to be identified. And when, when it comes to you acting in our name, you don't, you don't belong in this story. It was a really very powerful um, statement about their own um, devotion to the republic, even a republic that discriminated against them. Um, I think we should probably, yes, I think we should end. <laughs>